On this episode of China Unscripted, nearly 20,000 people have been killed so far in the Israel-Hamas war, and the Chinese Communist Party has played a surprising role. Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Kanesta. And joining us once again is Johnson Crystal. He's a professor of international affairs at Yeshiva University in New York City, and he's written about the Middle East and East Asia for publications including ARC, Digital, CNN, Mike, and World Policy Journal. It's great to have you back on the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So last time we had you on to talk about uh, China and the Middle East, um, wow, we had you, we recorded it on October 6th, and some, some oh, things changed the next day. Yeah, I, I, I don't know how it affected your uh, viewership, but I know that for, for me, um, you know, starting from that next day, really all the way through to now, um, everything is kind of different. I mean, it's sort of the same stuff I do anyway, but but it's still a lot, uh, certainly a lot has changed um, and not for the better. Yeah, well... <laughs> Oh boy, yeah, it's been a nightmare following all of this. Very uh, contentious topic. So, uh, so let's we'll, jump right in. <laughs> yeah, well, we're, I think we'll focus a lot on uh, still the China angle, of course. And you, you know, the United States views Hamas as a terrorist organization. At least the official government does. Some people in the United States apparently have other ideas about Hamas. But anyway, uh, what is China? How does China view Hamas? Well, Hamas is not a registered foreign terrorist organization um, in Beijing, um, which is unfortunately the case in much of the world. Um, it's really only the U.S., some of Central American countries, some Western European countries, and a couple of miscellaneous others that officially label Hamas that way. So for China, um, China's position is that Hamas is a legitimate political party um, on occasion, they have said, referred to it as a resistance movement, although I should say I don't know for sure whether that is a function of translation um, or not, because I don't believe they've used those words in English, uh, to my knowledge. But they kind of use those interchangeably. They don't use the word terrorist. They have not um, condemned the Hamas attack per se, other than in the context of Oh, it's always a you know it's always a tragedy when civilians die on both sides. Like they've sort of both sides it. They've to some extent what about it? It and as you may have seen just a few days ago, the IDF in Gaza found uh, a stockpile of Chinese manufactured weapons. Israel has been very disappointed in China's response, and that's really sort of the icing on a kind of disgusting cake um, that no one would want to eat. I guess. Well, well, with those weapons, like, do you think that was an issue of like China directly selling it to Hamas, or is it like the AK forty seven, where those just those are just kind of everywhere, and they got some? I think it's actually a bit in between, right? So there's no evidence to suggest, nor is there any particular reason why China would take the risk of attempting to sell weapons directly to Hamas. But what we know that China does do is China arms Iran with a wide range of weapons. And, you know, on the one, that's bad enough for all sorts of reasons we can talk about and, and have talked about the last time I was on. But what that does is it both allows Iran to freeze up other weapons that, that they may or may not need to sell to Hamas or really to, to give to Hamas. But it also means Iran can, if it so chooses, act as a pass-through um, and take those Chinese weapons and deliver them to Hamas. Now, again, I'm not suggesting that the intent of China is to give them to Hamas for use against Israel. However, as a major trading partner of Iran, as one of the most significant suppliers of weapons to Iran, it certainly is within China's power to say, look, these weapons cannot go outside of Iran. Right? They can be used to defend the Iranian state, but if we see evidence that they are being transmitted to groups like Hamas to use in attacks on states that they themselves have a lot of business with, you know, then we're gonna cut, we're gonna cut you off. Right. So there are steps they could take to potentially mitigate the flow of Chinese weapons um, into Gaza, 
that clearly they either are unable or unwilling to take. Uh, and we'll see how they react over the coming days as as this becomes a bigger and bigger story in the Israeli press. I would hope it breaks through a bit in the U.S. press. I think it's broken through a little, but as it becomes uh, more widely reported. So has there been any response from the Chinese side so far? No, not, not more. Not really. I mean, not, not yet. I mean, it happened just a, a few days ago. Um, China has essentially no commented it. I imagine it will. They have not made any sort of official statement on the conflict in Gaza in the last two weeks or so. I think since around uh, December 13th, it could be off by a couple of days. Um, and so it hasn't really been directly addressed. I would imagine that they will say that it's their policy not to give weapons to Hamas, and but who knows, things happen. You know, or that, that would be what I would imagine they would say. Yeah, so it seems, seems to me like China doesn't, you know, uh, explicitly condemn Hamas, and they certainly don't go out of their way to prevent their weapons from getting into the hands of Hamas. Are there ways China is 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 directly supporting Hamas? Well, you know, I think for Hamas, the most important thing that they need right now is political support in international institutions and, in some sense, sort of on the street. Now, uh, unfortunately, and almost totally mind-boggling to me, um, even after studying this region for more than 20 years, they have a lot of support in the street here in the U.S. and in Western Europe and stuff all all too much. Um, But what they don't have here is political support, and they don't have backing at the U.N. from the U.S. or even... um, or any of our Western allies. And that's something that China and Russia um, can provide. And so in the UN system, um, China acts, um, I don't want to say they act on behalf of Hamas, which implies that they're sort of taking direction, which is not the case. But they certainly are a roadblock to getting anything through the Security Council that is realistic for the US to sign on to, anything that is realistic for Israel to agree to, anything that actually would would promote some sort of wider resolution. And so, you know, in some sense where it counts, China does what it can um, to help Hamas politically. Um, It doesn't, not not to the extent of Iran, right? Um, China does not have a policy of trying to destroy Israel, right? They have fundamental disagreements with Hamas on a couple of key things, not least is that, certainly the role of religion in public life is another, but they do have um, some significant shared interests that I think in Beijing, they see that the way, the, the best way they can assist without being dragged into a fight is, blo- is, is either blocking U.S. attempts to, to counter Hamas or sort of indirectly-ish standing up for them um, in international fora. Well, I know the Chinese Communist Party loves its unrestricted warfare and, you know, fanning the flames of political divide in the U.S. Do Do you get a sense they are involved in or taking advantage of the political turmoil that this is causing within the U.S.? Because as you mentioned, it's become a very... Absolutely. It, it, I, I'm, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that this is one of the two sort of core interests that China has here. One, right, is exactly as you say, that they're using this as a way to, um, is similar to what Russia has done uh, for years, as a way to divide American society and Western society to highlight divisions, especially between young people. Um, as I'm sure your listeners, uh, many of your listeners have 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 read um, and seen reports on early on, there was a lot of indication that the TikTok algorithm was promoting pro-Hamas posts um, and sort of disseminating um, that view to a lot of people who maybe knew nothing about this conflict. And their first exposure is these sort of catchy, um, you know, pro-Hamas 
clips that then leads to other ones and leads to other ones. Now, you could say that people say, oh, well, China doesn't do that with TikTok. But leaving aside, we know that they do in some cases. This, in the few days leading up to President Biden's meeting with Xi Jinping, that was really ramped down. And the viewership of pro-Hamas, um, or the, uh, I don't know, the viewership, but I forget the word for the number of times it will appear, right, that it was not promoting or highlighting those videos in the five or six days leading up to that meeting uh, on the West Coast. And it has sustained at a bit of a lower level than it was earlier on since then, right? And I don't think anyone thinks that's coincidental. I think that that was, they were trying to sort of tone it down a bit in advance of what were going to be some tough discussions, I think, um, with the U.S. Um, and, you know, and uh, unfortunately, I think it's been, that's been quite effective. Um, and the other thing, sort of core interest that China has in this conflict, you know, is not, again, it's not that they have common cause with Hamas on like sort of Hamas's core issues, right? Like China, there's no indication China wants to destroy Israel. That makes no sense. First of all, for them, Israel's all too willing to accept Chinese investment. But what they have in common with Hamas and with Russia and with North Korea and with Iran and other groups is this desire to undermine not just the international order, you know, in a large scale, but to undermine the premise of state sovereignty and non-territorial, um, the, the acquiring of territory by force, right? And this hey, Hamas wants to wipe Israel off the map. Iran wants to wipe Israel off the map. Russia wants to wipe Ukraine off the map. Um, North Korea wants to wipe South Korea off the map. They sort of said that more explicitly even just last week. And um, China wants to do the same to Taiwan. Um, and in some sense has done that to Tibet and elsewhere already um, long ago. And so they have this shared um, sort of vision of the world, even if they might have some very strong disagreements about specific policies sort of along the way. Uh, do you think, Jonathan, I'm just thinking about the history of uh, the Chinese Communist Party and like the Palestinian territories and how they had kind of supported the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, historically. Do you think that plays into their current support of Hamas? Could you talk a little bit about how historically they've treated the PLO? Like on sure. the ideological Marxist mm -hmm. level? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, it's this is exactly right. Um, from Mao early on said that there was common cause between the Chinese communist revolutionaries and the PLO. He they established very warm ties um, with Arafat um, in terms of training and assistance. And, and just as we see now vis-a-vis -vis Hamas with a lot of, um, excuse me, rhetorical support. And I don't want to discount that. I, I'm not saying that as a slight. That's important in international arenas. Um, and so there had been for decades, sort of official CCP policy was to support resist, resistance uh, against Israel. And they framed it as this resistant, uh, resistance against the, the West and Western hegemony. That started to change um, in the mid-90s, um, not just because of the Oslo process, although that uh, peace process in between Israel and the Palestinians, but as part of China's um, economic opening. And, you know, that was scaled back a bit. And that's when you started to see an increase in Chinese investment in Israel. Um, they established diplomatic relations in 1992. It had not been as much of a feature of Chinese foreign policy. In fact, their, their policies had seemed to be for the last couple of decades this is a good area in which we should stay out. Like everyone who gets involved, like it doesn't work out well for anyone involved. It sort of goes nowhere. So on occasion they would talk about, oh, the Chinese plan for peace, but it wasn't until really Xi Jinping that you see a kind of reversion back to a more traditional 
uh, approach. But you know, the situation on the ground has changed. Now, the other thing that you you mention or allude to is that there was this, um, to a degree, ideological common cause, because the PLO and the PFLP and some of the lesser known non-Islamist Palestinian terrorist groups in the 60s and 70s were fellow travelers. You know, they were, uh, the PFLP is a Marxist group, still exists. They're not a religious group at all. Um, they played a minor role in the October 7th attack. The PLO itself had, though there was a lot of, you know, corruption and siphoning of wealth to the top, but their rhetoric was also based in sort of the far left, um, you know, in a sort of a communist type approach. They didn't follow through on that always. And so there was this sort of ideological kinship in a way um, that is not, that's a bit different now where sort of the dominant resistance forces are Islamist religious forces, and that makes it a little bit trickier, at least in the long run, for for both sides, to be honest. Um, you know, although no one seems to care in the region about the Uyghurs anyway, but it, it, it at least on paper, should make it trickier in both directions. Yeah, I mean, one of the things you, you mentioned the last time we had you on that was interesting is that the Chinese Communist Party has really good relations with most Muslim-majority countries. And that is still a little bit baffling to me. How does that play into what's happening with Hamas? Well, it's, like, it, it's genuinely baffling. To me, it's a little bit more baffling in the direction of, right, in the direction of the, the Middle Eastern countries, their view of China. But I, I think part of the explanation is, you know, China can't really afford to ignore the region. Right, because it is very reliant on oil coming out of the Persian Gulf. Uh, more than half of Chinese oil imports come through the Persian Gulf. And if you think about what you see now with Houthi rebels attacking shipping, uh, in, in particular shipping bound for Israel with really any connection to Israel at all, well, in some sense, this is a good way. Chinese support for Hamas is sort of a good way to insulate themselves from potential Houthi attacks. I'm not talking about uh, tankers coming out of the Strait of Hormuz, but shipping in general in that region, right? So this is a good way for them to maybe, you know, stay on the sidelines of that. Um, in the other direction, from the major powers in the region, like Saudi Arabia and, and Iran and elsewhere, if you're Iran, it's sort of, well, if you have no friends, you're going to kind of take whatever help you can get. But in the other cases, I, I think it's a function of, of money, right? That the Chinese market is so big that they're willing to ignore what they're doing to their co-religionists and, and are able, not as much as maybe would have been the case, you know, 15 or 20 years ago, but are able to control a lot of the press in their own countries. And so we are more aware of these things than an older person in Saudi Arabia who just reads print media, maybe watches the state TV, like this is not something that's going to be highlighted because it makes MBS look bad. But at the end of the day, it's disturbing and mind-boggling that, that you would have these relationships while this is going on um, in China. Yeah, it's amazing. It's China, China works with Israel and Iran, Ukraine and Russia. The Montagues and the Capulets. <laughs> yeah. they could, they, they're great at playing both sides. Well, the the Israel Even thing. the U.S. Right? I mean, so so China, I think, is Israel's second largest trading partner. That's Israel, correct. Israel sells a bunch of stuff to China as well, including like microchips and technology, which China definitely absolutely doesn't use for its military. Um, but like Israel, like they're seeing Chinese weapons with Hamas. They see... Chinese support for Iran, which wants to nuke Israel. Why is Israel trading with China? I mean, this is another one of these weird situations that you see actually all over the Middle East in these sort of strange arrangements. So I think that the explanation for that, and, and what you said is exactly right, uh, China is Israel's largest, second largest trading partner. 
um, is the desire of Israel to hedge its bets vis-a-vis the United States, right? If, if the United States were, to, if you had a president, Rashida Tlaib, uh, which we're not going to have, but if you had, um, who was going to cut off all support for Israel, certainly all weapons, and probably do what they could to make sure they had um, little access to any Western-designed systems, well, or maybe even uh, in the free trade agreement, whatever, well, who are you going to turn to if you're a small country, a powerful one with nuclear weapons, but still a small country? You know, who are you going to turn to for some level of assistance and protection? Again, in, in the UN system or elsewhere, you would ideally want someone with a veto power in the Security Council. Well, China may not be ideal. Uh, it may not you, be desirable, but... United Kingdom, France, Germany, Australia, Japan. There's a lot of countries that would support Israel. Well, a lot of those don't US. have veto power. You know? Well, the UK does. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, perfectly reasonable, but I think that the view would be, and by the way, I'm not saying, I'm, this is an explanation, I think this is a misguided policy for many reasons, including that one, but I think the Israeli view would be, well, if the that the UK and France are likely to go along with the United States, what, one way or the other, um, or at the very least not try to make too, ma- too many waves there, and so you know, what, what are we going to do? China's probably more desirable than Russia in, in that regard, but frankly, it's also been too soft on Russia as well. Now, I will say, we will see if these policies change over the next few months. The other thing we talked about when I was last on your show um, is uh, Chinese control of Haifa port. Um, and then, as you mentioned, their Chinese investment in Israel is very targeted at specific technologies, specific technologies and companies that do not rely on investment from the U.S. Defense Department, because those Israel would not be allowed to sell to China. But as we know, Israel has a lot of indigenous high-tech capability that is very attractive to China and, and to the Gulf states, that we try to pressure Israel not to sell. Sometimes that works. Sometimes that doesn't work. Um, But now Israel is going to be faced with this dilemma where on the one hand, thinking very long term, well, what happens? You know, we see that there are people protesting, you know, practically outside my window here in Manhattan, um, you know, sort of in favor of Hamas. That's sort of troubling in a way where we see um, that the winds, the political winds might change in the U.S. But now when we look at China, we see, well, China hasn't condemned Hamas at all. And Chinese weapons are being used against us. And North Korean weapons are being used against us. Not to mention, um, you know, assistance with tunnels and things like that. And so I think that when the the war winds down, especially when Netanyahu was forced out of office, which is uh, inevitable, um, I think that there will, it is likely there will be a rethink about this. I think, well, maybe this is not the right approach. Well, I think this is, this is a great example of Chinese unrestricted warfare. The idea that, you know, you say uh, Israel might be using um, China as a way to hedge its bets against the U.S. What does China do? Well, they have TikTok. They push increasingly extreme anti-Israel pro Hamas views on TikTok to Americans who then vote potentially creating this greater divide between the U.S. and Israel. Israel has to go to China, maybe sell some more of that high-tech stuff that the U.S. hasn't been giving to China. Like, it's it's brilliant. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it makes sense, I think. But the on the one hand, it makes sense. But what China lacks, and I think this is where you start to see a crack in this plan, um, is they don't have a deep bench or a long history of expertise in the region, right? That they have for a long time tried to stay out of local politics as much as they can. I think we may have mentioned last time, right, the first sign that they were really trying to get involved was to perhaps be involved in the reconstruction of Syria through the appointment of their first special envoy. As you've mentioned today, they've tried to have a decent relationship with every country and every group. Um, it, it, from from Israel all the way through to Iran, 
or from Morocco really to Iran. Um, but, but they don't necessarily have the experience and the knowledge of the players that will allow them to walk a fine line for a very long time. And you know, there are very few people from the region who study in Chinese universities. There are not so many Chinese who study in um, some in Israel, but not so many in regional universities either. There's not a lot of cultural exchange. They don't have a long sense of the history. And I think this is where you start to see it, where, you know, not condemning Hamas, even when, let's, let's point out that, yes, the population in the Arab states, a lot of them are relatively supportive. But China's statements have been far weaker than many of the Arab states who have condemned Hamas. They might say, we condemn Hamas, but also we condemn this. But the Arab states, almost all, not quite all, have explicitly condemned the October 7th attack, have emphasized the importance of, of restraining Hamas at minimum. China has not done that. So they're actually not even as far out as, as Hamas's uh, ostensible um, audience. You mentioned that um, it, the Israeli policy may change in the next few months in regard to how the Chinese uh, like side has been treating Hamas. Do you see a change in the popular like uh, view of China in Israel? Like you know, you like mentioned the common people on the street, or kind of in the press, that kind of thing. So I think so. Um, I do follow the Israeli press. I'm. My Hebrew is pretty good, so I can somewhat follow in Hebrew, though I then tend to uh, switch to English to, to, if I need to do it faster. And you, we already are seeing that a bit in the press. The Hebrew language press tends to uh, lead by three or four days from the English press, which then lags by another few days for when things hit the United States and Western press. So we already start to see that. But I would say it is, for the moment, a bit more of a press issue in a way, again, a sort of elite issue. But I think part of that is in Israel, you know, it's, yes, it's been three months. People, people here have people's attention spans wander. A lot of things happen in the world. There aren't as many protests out on the street here in Manhattan as there were, so there are still too many. But, um, but that's not the case in Israel, right? In Israel, the, the war is front of mind, middle of mind, and back of mind. There are hundreds of thousands of Israelis who are living in hotels in the middle of the country, both evacuated from the north and from the south. And I don't think that there's really the bandwidth for people to start thinking too much about specific things that will change. But I do think that there will be a change, and I do think that it will be a, a ground-up change, right? It will be something that the people will be upset about and if policymakers want to, and first of all, that's something the U.S. should absolutely take advantage of and try to highlight um, whenever and wherever we can, um, in part as a way to maybe get Israel to push back on Chinese investment you know, uh, uh, in the long run. So I think that's something that we should and hopefully will exploit. But I think it, it, there, Israeli politicians will have to make a case to the public why they should ignore China's position on this war. I don't think that case is going to be priority one, two, or three for the politicians to bother with. And I think it's a really tough case to make. Um, I think that there is very much a view of we are learning who our, who our friends are um, and, and, and who they are not. Plus, China has concentration camps that commit ethnic cleansing, so... That should resonate a bit. Absolutely, <laughs> and and I think, and I think does, but at the political level, the investment and the desire for uh, friends in high places, I think, trumps that a bit. So, I guess, do you feel like these attacks, because Israel has been attacked many times over the years, do you think this is this is a fundamental? This is going to fundamentally change things. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, it is the 
third deadliest attack, terrorist attack in world history, just in terms of number of people killed. And on a per capita basis, it's by far the number one. And as, as you know, mainstream media have, have correctly reported, if we imagine this happening in the U.S., it would be between 40 and 50,000 people killed. I mean, if 40 or 50,000 people were killed by a terrorist group here, I mean, we know what happened after 3,000 were. But I think that that would fundamentally reshape not just U.S. politics, but global politics. And Israel doesn't have that reach, um, right? and the raw numbers aren't that big. But it absolutely will force a fundamental rethink of Israel's foreign policy, defense policy um, position, uh, regional position, um, as well as domestic politics, uh, which, which were a mess before this uh, and will are starting to become a little bit of a mess again, but will definitely become a mess again uh, you know, at a certain point, but it will shake out differently as a result of this. And I think the the days where Israel will tolerate the idea of a an acceptable level of consistent attack, cross-border attacks, I, I think that the entire premise of that is done. And at a certain point, something more will end up happening on the northern border vis-a-vis -vis Hezbollah. And that in the long run, I think Israel will target not only the leaders of Hamas, wherever they may be, but also the leaders of Palestinian Islamic Jihad, of the PFLP, which is still active, um, and even some of the groups that the U.S. doesn't yet designate um, as terrorists. Well, so this is going to be kind of a situation where Israel, as you say, kind of sees who its real friends are and who's, you know, trying to play both sides or outright hostile. How do you think it will view the U.S.? Because, you know, on the one hand, there's been a lot of support in the U.S. for Israel. I think by polls, most people do support Israel. But then you also have, you know, BLM supporting the 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 specific Hamas paratroopers who committed the – who did the attack. Uh, so how do you think uh, they're going to be viewing the U.S.? Well, I actually think that this is something where the U.S. – media and the Israeli media diverge quite a bit in how it's presented. I, I think that positive feelings for the U.S. and the U.S. administration in general are extremely high. Like the views of – Israel is one of the few places in the world that had – a uh, in which pres former President Trump had a more than 50 percent approval. I think it was Israel, India, and like I don't know, one or two other places. Um, but Biden is now the most popular U.S. president in Israeli history. Um, and even among people who I know and have seen talk and who I know personally who are quite conservative, who would n never vote for Joe Biden in a million years, they have praised him publicly and his um, position on the war in ways that I would not, never have imagined. Um, in Israel, there are Hebrew billboards of Biden thanking Biden for his support, thanking the administration. And what we see here in terms of the protests, in terms of the position, not just of, of the far left like R Rashida Tlaib or uh, Ilhan Omar or AOC, but also from like Louis Gomer and the sort of far right or Rand Paul and the sort of isolationist wing, like there's awareness of that. But I think that there is also enough of an understanding, actually more of an understanding than many Americans have, that despite the coverage in the media, like the Israelis are pretty well aware that the polling in the U.S. still has tremendous support for Israel in a way that I think many Americans don't realize because it's the people who are loud who you see and who make headlines. And it's the young, loud people that are sort of the anti-Israel people. And, you know, the sad, this is, a, you know, in this case, it might work out for a position I favor, but the sad reality in the U.S. is like young people don't vote. I mean, they vote at significantly lower rates. And, you know, and, and so I don't, I think there's more awareness there 
that there's not any sort of sea change here than there is here, if that makes sense. Well, so this could be a situation where the U.S. really can take advantage, uh, maybe taking advantage is the right word, but, you know, if Israel sees that China has been, let's say, at best, wishy-washy, and the U.S. gives them support, uh, the U.S. might be able to put a little more pressure on Israel to, you know, stop them from selling chips in this technology to China. I very much hope so. I mean, I, you know, as you said, I, I try to highlight this wherever I can. When I was last on on the show on October 6th, I tried to highlight it. And then, of course, the the next day I'm thinking, huh, now there will be this uh, video out with me really going after Israel um, out on October 7th, um, which of which the timing obviously couldn't, couldn't be helped. But I stand by the position I took. I mean, I think the U.S. has a lot of leverage over Israel because of the support we provide. I am supportive of that support but I'm supportive of it in part because of the leverage. And we're not using that leverage um, in a way. So I think that we should have done more before. I think we can do even more now. And when I say now, I mean right now, it's not going to go over too well. If we just say if tomorrow there was a statement about it. But in a few months, as the war does start to wind down or does wind down, this is absolutely something that the United States should do. I would hope, well, you know, I've been wrong before, but I would hope that it would be met much more receptively in the Knesset than it would have been prior to October 7th because of, of I think, what I think is China's mistake, both moral and strategic, in, you know, in, in supporting uh, Hamas. Well, leverage to do what specifically? Are you talking about just with China, or what do you mean by leverage? Oh, well, in this context, talking about about vis-a-vis China, right? That I, I think that Israel should be much less willing. I mean, Israel does not have to allow chi- Chinese firms to invest in high tech industries that produce dual use technology. I thought, there's no, there's no, not some sort of requirement that they do that. And the Israel, unlike here. The Israeli government, even in private sector firms, the Israeli government tends to own a stake, right? If if the Israeli defense ministry invests in a company, they actually take an ownership stake, which U.S. law prohibits here. Use that to your advantage. Like, the government's part of an owner of the company. They, They don't even have to pass any sort of new legislation about it. Just on the internal board of directors type level, Veto it, veto it, veto it. Don't all, you know, wh- why is it happening? Um, and and when it comes to, you know, I, again, I get that there are, could be contractual issues, but China should play no role in major investment in infrastructure programs in Israel itself, which it does, um, and a little bit trickier from the Israeli side, but it really shouldn't be allowed to do so in Gaza either. I mean, and that's, you. if we see from the Syrian experience, I would assume that one of China's sort of end games here is that they would like to be the ones, not to govern Gaza, because no one on earth really wants to do that, but someone's going to have to rebuild it. Um, right, and the, there are states in the region that will have the money to fund it, but are not going to have the capacity to rebuild. And China, you know, will have that capacity if there is a way, a, a legal way for Israel to do what it can in that regard to push back on it. I think it should. That, that might be a tougher one. But there are things that, that it can do. Um, it, one thing Israel does is when the U.S., um, you know, there's some technical things, there's a blacklisting, but when the U.S. says, okay, firm X, like, we don't want you to sell this technology that allows you to listen into someone's phone without even them opening, whatever. We don't want you to sell it to any U.S. adversaries or to a short list. What that company often does is just reincorporate as a new company or a spinoff and do it anyway. This is something where we should pressure Israeli politicians to 
pass, get a law passed through the Knesset to prevent that from happening. And again, I think maybe there will be more appetite for that now. Uh, and I mean more appetite for that there, right? Where the, the argument about hedging, the argument about just the need to make money, the ar- all those arguments, I think, I think will be less salient than the, yeah, but look, we found these weapons there and w- what did they do? Or what was their position on the war? Of course, I guess this all assumes who's ever in charge of the U.S. a year from now wants to make use of that leverage. Yes, this is a very good point. Um, <laughs> that, um, that, that I try to block out of out of my mind. I'm not looking forward to this I, year. <laughs> I, I, it kind of just suddenly hit me that it's actually like only a year away that there's going to be potentially a new president. Yeah. Uh, uh, and there's voting wow. in two weeks. I mean, I want It's a move. super Tuesday. Uh, it's uh no, uh, that yeah. that is a good that is a good point. It, it is um definitely definitely a concern. Um I think though that depending on who the next Israeli prime minister is, it might be less of a concern. Like it's a, it's a genuine might. It, it really depends. It could be that someone comes in who that is already their view. Who or because it's not like the Israeli society is so uni, it's so divided in every way except some sort of love of China. Like that's ludicrous. So it could be that whoever comes in already is somewhat hawkish about this, and there will be a political will to get something done. That is a possibility. Um, but it's also possible, but the opposite is also possible. So, um, so we'll see, but I, again, I think it's going to be more driven, probably more driven by the Israeli public anyway than by the U S. Um, but, but your point is very, very, very well taken and horrifying. Uh, do you, is there like in Israel, like in the U S it kind of is like, okay, you see maybe conservatives being more concerned about China and the CCP. Uh, I mean, I think it's a bit more broad because there's something like 70 some percent of Americans don't trust China, uh, according to like Pew polls. But um, I think the perception is that of the two political parties, more Republicans have been harder on China. Um, is there like any kind of breakdown like that in Israel not not really. It's 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 sort of too hard to break it down by party in part because the nature of the Israeli political system is that in each election there can be completely different parties. Um and there's some that are kind of always there although the rise and decline of support is extremely dramatic. But unlike here, you know, if you started a new party tomorrow, you'd be lucky to get a city council seat like, I don't know, in like Waterbury, Connecticut, just making that up as a place. In Israel, you could start a new party tomorrow and get 15 seats uh, in the Knesset and sort of be the kingmaker. Um, And so it's very hard to do polling by party very far in advance. And, you know, you can also have a situation like we have now where Netanyahu, you know, his, his support is at a historic low. But even when he keeps winning these elections, he wins with like 28, 30% support. And so it's it's just very hard, hard to say. And I, I would also, and hard in the moment, and probably the moment is going to be this whole year, because it's not something that anyone probably is, is spending a lot of time thinking about. Um. In the same way that if we were at war with Mexico and Canada was at the same time firing missiles uh, across the border, you know, we we might not think about it too much either. We would think about it if China was arming Canada, but but the average person as they go about their life is going to be much more worried about the actual missile that's coming to hit them than about the broader geopolitics. So yeah, I mean. If- we talked about that a bit before the attack, even I think the last time you were on that, like China is not necessarily top of mind for exactly, you know, yeah, 
But I will say one, but we have seen polling in the in December. I forget the date. And I think around the, uh, December nineteenth ish, um, there have been some polls released from the region, and you know the sad reality is that support for Hamas um, is not high, but it is higher than it was. As is support for China as is support for Russia. It's not, again, in some cases it's above 50%, but it's in many cases not. But relative to what it was on October 6th, support for China in the region in general, outside of Israel, has had a slight to moderate increase in support, ranging, depending on the state, from about 1% or 2% within the margin of error to about 10 to 12%. Um, and that is thought to be tied to the perception that China is truly a, a, a neutral arbiter and the U.S. is just, um, it will just back whatever uh, Israel does. Do you have a sense for how people living in Gaza perceive China and perceive Hamas? That's a great question because support for Hamas has increased throughout the region everywhere but Gaza where in Gaza, support for Hamas has dramatically decreased. Now, there are two possible explanations. One is that it hasn't actually decreased. It's just that the freedom of people to answer the polling question, that that's the change, that they're not as worried about the Hamas guy um, coming to remind them later um, to go back and change their answer uh, at best. That's possible. And it could also be the like, look, we've lived under these people and we know that they have brought this on us and we didn't want this. And so of, of all places, and this is separated by West Bank and Gaza and all of these regional and local breakdowns, the place where support for Hamas has dropped the most um, and, and is pretty low is Gaza. It's increased in the West Bank. Um, and... Yeah, I, I what, might about, have what about China? Is there any polling about China and Gaza? To my knowledge, there has not been polling about about China and Gaza since the war began. Probably due to the nature of the the war itself. Um, sure. And that doesn't seem that important, right? Yeah, and I think the polling on Gaza is able to take place because you also have a lot of Israelis that are native Arabic speakers and Israeli Arabs who you know do it and. and they're all going to be focused on perception of, of the conflict. Um, but in jet before the war, the support for China was fairly high above 50%. If I remember correctly across the West bank and Gaza, um, though not, you know, it's not like 90%, but majority had a favorable view and the basis for that favorable view in the majority of those people is essentially comes down to uh, opposition to Israel and the West. And not necessarily Israel specifically, but sort of the broader like opposition to the West. Well, well since you mentioned West Bank, we haven't really, we've been focusing obviously on Gaza and Hamas. Uh, what, is, what is China doing as far as the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank? China actually has a, had a very hands-off approach, at least, maybe not, um, uh, uh, yeah, at least when it comes to providing any sort of real assistance, right? China has provided in terms of humanitarian aid, not, I'm not talking about the war, but just over the last year, um, to the Palestinian Authority um, as a whole, I believe it's about one one hundredth of the amount that just Japan has, right? And so China has very much um, tried to steer clear of being involved in internal Palestinian dynamics to the extent that there are too many, uh, 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 too much political machinations at the, t the moment. I think China sees that there is nothing to gain by it. I would guess that what they are doing is... And, and not the only ones doing this, is biding their time a little bit 
looking ahead to when Mahmoud Abbas, who has been the leader of the PA, essentially just rules the West Bank for you know, 20 years now or so, he's 87, he's human, so at some point we all die. I think like many actors, not just China, I think people are just looking a bit ahead and are trying to position themselves to be in the good graces of whoever it is that takes over. And, you know, for someone who's that old and been in power for that long, it is almost remarkable that we don't have uh, any sort of universal consensus about who it will be. He isn't named a successor. There are a few possible people. The number one candidate is in Israeli prison for murder. And so it's sort of it's sort of unclear. But they have generally had a fairly light touch. So you s- said earlier that you see the conflict between Hamas and Israel to be winding down in the next few months. Um, how do you see that going? Well, let me clarify a, a little bit. I think over the next few months, what will wind down is the sort of warlike aspect of that war in terms of air stri- constant airstrikes, in terms of the number of boots on the ground, which have already been um, withdrawn a bit, right? I think that the, the things that seem familiar to people as like what a war looks like, I think that that is going to be winding down. My hope is it's not going to be winding down as a war in the north winds up, although that is a possibility. Um, Israeli reservists, many uh, many thousands of Israeli reservists have been told that they are going to be off duty from around now until mid-March, and then there is going to be another call-up. So there is some concern, I guess, although there's widespread support for opening another front in the north. Um, Concern will be that it it will will go there, but it will be, the war part will wind down, but the fight against Hamas will continue indefinitely. And I think that it will be like what we all saw in the movie Munich, and that, you know, Yahya Sinwar, uh, Khaled Mashal, Ismail Haniya, um, the Hamas leaders, Israel is going to kill them. Like, it's only a matter of, I mean, like it took us 10 years to get bin Laden. I don't think it will take Israel that long. But even if it takes them that long, they're going to find these guys and kill them. And so, right. I mean, they just killed the uh, strategist in Beirut. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which is like, you know, basically Israel launching an airstrike in another country. Except in that case, if you look at the images and the reports, they managed to do that only blowing up the single room and only killing Hamas members. There were no Lebanese citizens killed in that. Um, And I don't think that that was an accident, Um, right? That they have been somewhat uh, as careful as they can. And I would guess that right now, almost literally, uh, because Amos Hochstein, who was the lead negotiator of the, or works for the State Department, who was the lead negotiator of the Israeli-Lebanese maritime border agreement, which required sort of Hezbollah's tacit approval. Hoxie negotiated that over the course of about 15 years. So he's very well connected in terms of negotiations between Israel and all actors in Lebanon. He was sent over there, I think, again, I think he arrived yesterday or he's arriving today. My guess is part of his role there is going to be to like try to calm things down not to talk Israel out of going after Hamas, but to try to calm things down between Hezbollah and Israel and to sort of establish a sort of revamped rules of the road for how they're going to deal with each other. So if Israel kills all the Hamas leadership, does that solve the problem forever? No, <laughs> not, not really. Um, I think... Um, first of all, I think it's the right thing to do, for sure. I think what it does do is certainly helps um, morale. I think it certainly helps to 
excuse me, reestablish. I think there's a lot of concern in Israel that other actors see that this type of attack is possible or just see that the IDF is not what we thought it was, right? The IDF has this reputation of eyes everywhere and knowing everything. That's, well, it's a problem if that sort of mythology is lost. And so attacks like this, in addition to, I think, being the right thing to do in terms of the moment, but in the long run, I think helps to reestablish that, which then helps to deter other actors. But look, are, is Israel going to actually be able to like destroy Hamas as an organization, as they, as Netanyahu keeps claiming? No, this is, this is a ridiculous thing to say. They've on occasion he's walked it back a little, but then he keeps, but then they keep saying the same thing, and you know that that's not going to happen. It's not going to actually solve the long-term problems. But, you know, if I could, if I had an idea for solving the long-term problem, you know, I, I, I'd have a, a bigger apartment on a higher floor. Oh, well, so, so like Israel's not going to destroy Hamas. Uh, Hamas is very unlikely to take over Israel. Uh, so then what? Well, I would argue that Israel doesn't need Israel shouldn't have said the goal was to destroy Hamas. And, and destroying Hamas, in some sense, is not what's important. What Israel might be able to do, which is really what matters, is to destroy the ability of Hamas to carry out significant terrorist attacks in Israel. And so that might be possible. Similarly, right, that there are, are more members of Al-Qaeda today than there were on September 10th, 2001. But the ability, but do we worry about it as, well, we weren't worried enough on September 10th, 2001, but are we worried about it now, about Al-Qaeda now, here, in the same way we were in 2002, 2003, 2004? Yeah, in Mali and Yemen, Burkina Faso, some places they are. But we didn't defeat Al-Qaeda, but we really did um, significantly degrade through targeted attacks and through just things like lock, you know, locks on uh, cockpit doors, we degraded their ability to attack us. And so, yeah, it would be great if no one was in Al Qaeda, but do we care that much as long as they don't have the ability to actually harm us? And I think that Israel might be able to get, you know, to, to do the same to Hamas. And so I think that they can be successful in the key aspect of their mission. But not in. But but you're going to take a an organization that had about thirty thousand fighters before October seventh, and those are just people fighting. Think about the supporters, in addition to the Hamas members and the logistics. What are you going to do with all those people? I mean, you can't. It's it's a ludicrous premise. Hmm. And it, go ahead. I was going to say, do you think Hamas's support within Gaza will remain weakened? Yes. I do. Um, I, I think that, again, it's a little bit unclear whether it was always weak and their ability to rule with a, a sort of an iron fist is what made maybe it made it seem otherwise. Um, also, Israel has a role in this, too, because Israel has uh, some politicians have definitely seen it as in their interest to uh, uh, provide a rosier picture of Hamas inside Gaza than might be the case, right? To try to say that Hamas has more support than it really does as a way to avoid making concessions to the Palestinians in general. And so it's always been a little bit vague how much people actually support Hamas versus how much they're allowed to say. But I think that Hamas's iron rule is done. And thus, people will be able to speak freely, and I think that the support will remain quite low. But you know, does that mean that Iran is not gonna is gonna stop providing funding? No. Does it mean that Hezbollah will not provide training and assistance to Hamas? No. Does it mean that DPRK is not going to more because there is much more overt than China is not gonna be okay with providing weapons? To Hamas? No, they'll still be okay. And is China going to like 
go nuts over them finding weapons there either, other than maybe for the press? Also, no. Well, clearly we need some kind of independent third party to negotiate some kind of peace. I, th- I think China might be a great <laughs> option. Well, that that's, that's one of the other kind of China's, uh, to the extent, I'm not sure in a binary, does China have an end game here? I'm not sure my answer would be yes. But it is clear that that's what they would love. They would love to do that, right? They put out a proposal uh, just a couple of weeks ago that was that that I, I think uh, went no further than six inches um, in, away from the foreign minister's mouth before it faded into nothingness. Um, I think that they would love to be seen as this great diplomatic force that brings peace to this difficult region. I think that there is a desire to do that, but whether they actually take concrete steps in any sort of reasonable way, pretty skeptical of. Because when it comes down to it, the only side that the Palestinian Authority and that Israel trusts is the United States. And it's not that the PA loves the United States, But the PA's view is that only the United States can guarantee that Israel won't violate whatever agreement it makes with them. And the PA, I have a very hard time imagining that they will see China as uh, as having that ability, even if they had the desire. What might get China more involved would be a tax on shipping. But as we talked about, I think, before, you know, the U.S. is a little bit in a little bit of a bind because we have a real need to secure the free flow of oil out of the region with our partners that China then can free ride on and not anger any of these groups. And, you know, that that's, that's something that I think, again, we have to find a better way to deal with but I, I, yeah, I wish I knew what that way would be. Well, thank you very much for joining us again. I, I really hope history doesn't repeat itself when we wake up tomorrow and there's some horrible breaking news event. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 2024 is going to be crazy enough year as it is. This is going to be something. Yeah. Um, One for the something. history books. Yeah. Or for the cave walls scratched on by primitive people in a post-apocalyptic landscape. One of those two. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Great to have you on. Thanks. My pleasure. I'm always happy to do it. A lot of fun. It's nice doing a podcast and feeling that, like, you know, we probably solved all the problems of the Middle East. <laughs> yes, we have on yes. China Unscripted. That's what why That's we what started we this show. That's what we do. We solve yeah. problems. Uh-huh. I was actually thinking about how what the CCP does is kind of the opposite like when he was talking about Opposite how of, of solving problems. Oh. oh, like the they when they get involved, like as long as they do what Jonathan was talking about, like having a light touch and not really getting involved, they can kind of keep everyone happy. But then as soon as they start to actually get involved, everybody gets uh, upset at them. I'm thinking about like things like the Philippines, right? Where like for a number of years. They were able to kind of make it seem like, oh, yeah, you know, we're going to come and be your new friend and, you know, let's build a friendship bridge and Manila, all this kind of stuff. And then when push came to shove, it's like, actually, the Philippines is like, no, actually, the U.S. is our friend and you suck. Well, it's partly because the CCP promised these massive investments in the Philippines under the Duterte presidency. And and then they just didn't follow through on the vast, vast majority of those I mean, things. but that is their MO. They right. promise a bunch of things that they don't follow through on. Yeah. So it never works out well. I mean, I expect to see the same pattern uh, in the Pacific Islands, uh, sure. in a lot of places where they're like, okay, yes, at first welcoming, uh, you know, Belt and Road investment or whatever. Same with Israel. Like at first, like, oh yeah, we want your investment in our high tech sector. So is what you're saying is that countries should not trust the Chinese Communist Party? Um, yes. Yes. Uh, well, I mean, also there are situations like you can't be a fence sitter 
all the time. Like with they were playing Russia and Ukraine. Eventually, you have to choose a side there. And same thing with Israel and Hamas. You can't be like when something like this happens. You can't be just like, um, let's be everyone's friend. I'm surprised they were able to fence it on the Russia Ukraine thing for over a year. You know. I mean, they're still trying to fence it. It's just clear which side of the fence they're sitting on. Fences I mean, aren't comfortable to sit on. I've tried. Have you? Mm-hmm. Well, so one of the things Tom that- Tom Sawyer, you know, sitting- He, he didn't sit, sit on, on, on a fence. fence. He was whitewashing the fence. No, he wasn't. He didn't whitewash it, but I don't necessarily think he sat on the fence. I'll have to go reread it. <laughs> um. So what I was going to say is- is when when China does get involved, one of the things they like to do is, in a subtle way, stir up conflict, right? So it's just like, you drive a wedge here, you drive a wedge there, you drive a wedge everywhere, and then the more wedges that you've driven. Sorry. I know, it's, it's my point is, though, the, the more wedges that the CCP drives between different countries, the more of a strategic advantage the Chinese Communist Party has in its own goals. Uh, for example, they see the U.S. too involved in Ukraine and Israel, and oh well, then maybe the U.S. won't put resources into defending Taiwan. I think they're wrong about that, but that I believe that's what they believe. Spread the U.S. too too thin makes sense. Yeah. What I want to know is, you guys really have never just sat on a fence, whittling, watching the sunset. Listen to some banjo. Um, I can't say that I have, Chris. Have you really lived? Yeah, no, I used to do that when I lived in Manhattan. <laughs> I mean, I believe that you could actually probably find many banjo players in certain parts you, of you New could. York City. In Brooklyn. More in Brooklyn. <laughs> fences probably Fences and sunsets are the harder part. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. <sighs> Yeah, well, I think we're sufficiently off the rails now to wrap up our podcast. Well, you know, when you said drive a wedge here, drive a wedge there, drive a wedge everywhere, <laughs> I started thinking of old McDonald's at a farm. farm. Okay, it wasn't just me. Okay. No, I, I also started thinking that, and I was like, oh, no, I've just done the old McDonald's song. <laughs> <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> on Chinese scripted, you see complex geopolitical analysis that's accidentally a nursery rhyme. Where else can you get that non CNN? Oh, Not on Fox News. Only here on Channel Scripted. Thank you for watching. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelly John. And I'm Matt Ganesta. And we'll C I E I O you later. <laughs>